Radigan is an important figure in the Lands Between. Not only is he a major boss and story character, but he's been married to two separate queens and important figures in their own right. One, the queen of the Carrion royal family in Ranala, and two, in Queen Merica, who is also himself. Between these two marriages, he would study both incantations and sorceries in an effort to become complete and establish his own golden order and either write or inspire the golden order Principia. This tome would combine his studies into both faith and intelligence in order to fill the perceived gaps he had within himself. Now, I wouldn't exactly call Radigan an inspirational figure, but there are some lessons I have recently decided to take from his efforts. As an invader, I've always felt very comfortable in my aggressiveness and ability to read players in this game. However, I realize I have left some more in-depth skills like inventory management and fast swapping on the shelf. So in the manner of Radigan, I set out to expand my own skill sets as an invader. Now let's talk about what this video is. This is an attempt to document the steps I have taken recently to become a better invader in this game, and to showcase some of the fun invasions and romps I've had along the way doing that. This is not an attempt to tell you how to fill in your own knowledge gaps and invasions, as that is highly specific and different from person to person. Because I had the opportunity to be in contact with and exposed to the content of a really awesome Souls PvP community all the time, I had recently begun to notice some skill sets and methods that a lot of them utilize that I've either let lapse in my own gameplay or I never really fleshed out myself. Particularly, there was one content creator who had a really great video about inventory management not too long ago, but I'll go into that a little bit more later on. Now, I had always been removing all unnecessary weapons from my builds and really narrowing down what it was I needed per character, and that had been a great first step, but I still didn't have any ironclad knowledge of where the things were I may need in my inventory without having to search for several seconds at a time, which is an eternity in Elden Ring. And compounded with having multiple invader builds meant I was constantly searching for things and never developing any long-term memory about how to access what I need. This had caused me unnecessary losses in invasions, unnecessary resource usage, and I knew had been a big hindrance to me overall. In this invasion, you will see me fumble for a club in my inventory for several seconds because of this, and in the next invasion, a number of issues will arise, including not always paying attention to what I have equipped in my offhand. I use a club for dealing with quick step and people trying to roll through my attacks. It plays a larger part in my build that I'll explain later on. But for now, what you need to know is I also have a soft swap in the Beast Seal in that same hand, which I use for a number of utility spells, including Bestial Vitality. What you will see happen a number of times in this video is me casting that Bestial Vitality and then forgetting to swap back to the club, which will lead me to again reproc and recast that Bestial Vitality, leaving me stuck in an animation that I did not need to be in eating R2s to the face, eating spells to the face, eating all sorts of things, and taking damage I did not need to take. So I did what any nerd would do. I made a build to practice these things and address them. So I hope you enjoy the video.
But I knew in order to learn these new skill sets and apply them in my gameplay, I would have to go back to the basics. I'd have to put on my Juvenile Stellar cap, my Juvenile Stellar robes, and take a humble pill to go back and learn the things I actually needed to learn. Take the baby steps that were necessary to really master these concepts. So I started looking at my inventory, and I started watching some people who did some videos on inventory management, and talked about these things. And I started iterating it. I started practicing switching out weapons as soon as I could. Hey! Oh shit, he sees us. Oh, hey! Hey! If you want to take this class, you're going to have to pay for it like the rest of these bitches. What are you? Dancing in the park. Dance class. You are not dancing. You are not dancing in the park. <laughs> Sorry, no name, I didn't actually have the runes to pay you adequately at this time. <laughs> Alright, let's discuss my inventory and what I have chosen as my setup moving forward. First off, this is not meant to be instructional, but more to show what I've been iterating on builds. For an actual instructional video, go check out No Name's content in the description below, as it is very well done and he provides several different setup options to consider. I have chosen to utilize the cross to easily have access to fast swap chase down to the left of my root weapon in the Nagakiba, piercing fame flamberge on the right, and more of a fun option in the wild strikes dismounted below. And this is still being iterated, it's not done in its final form. Talismans are great jars arsenal, bull goats because I don't like to be bullied, Millicent's prosthesis, and the rock kin talisman. My physic is the standard I always use with crimson bubble tea or an opaline. Oh, uh, <laughs> shit fumbled. Uh, let's go swap that out real quick. Well, we head back to my invasion base. I want to quickly show you my quick swap inventory here and that I've chosen to place my cerulean and crimson flask here instead of the traditional inventory slots. I think this is still largely preference based for invaders. But I found a lot of success with it and I would encourage you to try it if you haven't tested it before because I found it works a lot better for me now. Also, my root weapon is the Nagakiba and I just wanted to make a brief mention that again this is a strength build. So it's not like this is the perfect weapon or fit for this build but it does work just fine. It has a lot of reach and it's just a great weapon overall. Being a strength build, I get access to the Jar Cannon, and it's such a nice tool for invasions, it really is. Uh, is a ranged option, is a damage option, is a knock people off of ledges option, it's such a useful tool to have. In a situation in an invasion like this, where the host is on Overwatch casting spells down at me, and the Phantom here is, I'm not sure if they're over level or not, but they're definitely probably have more health than the host up there, using Blintstone Pebble on their weapon, I'm getting pelted constantly by uh, either one of them when I turn my attention away for a second. Those Blintstone Pebbles from up top are not enough to stagger me on the first hit, but they're on the second hit. And as you can see, they're doing a good job of comboing me with them. So I'm either going to have to take down this Phantom or find a way to take down the Host. Uh, as I can't climb that ladder, because if I do, that Phantom will be right behind me with that Blintstone Pebble and just knock me off or kill me outright. So what to do about the situation? Well, I do have access to the Jar Cannon, which is very, very handy. So all I have to do is wait for that Phantom to be distracted for a minute, and then I can get shots at the Host up there. Fortunately for me, a lot of times in this situation, if you have a host like this who's hiding up top, they're probably squishy, and the Phantom is kind of running them through this game. And they will do anything at all to protect them from even the slightest bit of PvE. So fortunately, there is one last bit of PvE behind me, and I will just wait for them to come in and see if it can distract this Phantom. So you see there, I take that Flintstone Chris bolt right to my face. That was not a good trade. All right, now you see this PVE is coming in, and I'm watching to see what the host and Phantom do interacting with it. Fortunately, the PVE is going to attack the host up there because he is spamming Blintstone Pebble at it. And I will have a moment, a moment to switch back to the Jar Cannon and get shots at the host while the Phantom is distracted. There's not really a whole lot more to say about the Jar Cannon. Everyone knows why it's a staple on strength builds. It's just a great range tool, probably the best one you have for that kind of build. Uh, and so, yeah, it's just something that should be pretty standard uh, across the board 
I will talk about the Uchigatana a little bit more, the Uchigatana Lord, the Nagihiba a little bit more, which is just a long version of the Uchigatana. It really has an incredible reach to it. Uh, with any Ash of War on it, like, you know, uh, Unsheath, Spinning Slash, Piercing Fang, you really can't go wrong. It has so many strong mix-ups and combos you can add on to it. It's a great weapon. Uh, what I like is just the Spinning Slash Ash of War, not only because it's strong, but because the first L2 can actually chain into an R2. It is not a true combo, but for people who have low poise, it roll catches very well. And that R2 on the second part hits and lands way more than you think it would. I think it just does a good job of catching eaten inputs, but regardless, uh, it works very, very well. Now let's talk about some of the quick swapping on my build. The Halberd is my quick swap second option to the left of my root weapon on this. Uh, and you might be wondering why it's not you know, the best option for a chase down weapon on this build is not the first option I have uh, to swap over to, and therefore the most effective one to actually reach. Uh, it's because I, I don't I don't have a, an issue with halberds intrinsically, but patch 1.009 still didn't really do anything to halberds. They're still one of the best, if not the best weapon set or the best weapon uh, type in the game. Pokes are still incredibly strong. Uh, and despite the fact that now actually something kind of nifty with guard counters, uh, if you're using a guard counter with a fast weapon, you can actually interrupt an R1 chain of someone just trying to R1 you to death with a halberd. Uh, this will work on, you know, medium to medium plus uh, experienced halberd players. Uh, the guard counter will come out faster uh, than they can actually keep spamming R1 at you so you can interrupt them, so that's kind of handy. But again, despite that, it's still like halberds are one of the best weapons in the game and they will remain to be that way forever. So I don't like to pull this out against every run of the mill player that I come across. That's why I keep the spear uh, with sword dance as the first quick swap option I have to the left for chasing down. I just sleep a little better at night when I use this a lot more often. That being said, you know, if someone's using like a heavy thrusting sword, a thrusting sword of their own halberd against me and they're just trying to run me down, I don't really have a whole lot of issue uh, with pulling out my own and doing that, essentially, I think it's fine. Uh, also, a, a quick brief note about why the Halberd is poison infused with the Poison Mist Ash of War, because I'm sure if you're a nerd, you've noticed that. Uh, and if you're a bigger nerd, you're probably wondering if that's redundant. I think I have some big nerds that watch this, and, you know, that's a fair question. Uh, my answer to that would be that I uh, am a light nerd, and I don't have many Cerulean Flasks on this build, because my light nerd juice uh, is limited. I, uh, I will run out of a way to prop poison on my halberd if I run out of those cerulean flasks and can't cast that ash war anymore, correct? So, you know, if I do that and I don't have, you know, a way to proc poison, or not proc poison, well, to proc poison, but I don't have a way to put poison on the halberd, uh, I've, lose that, I've lost access to poison is, an, is a thing on this build, right? So I no longer have a really powerful tool for dealing with over level phantoms, dealing with more than one player, putting pressure on people. I just don't want to lose access to something that uh, I've kind of made a key element to this build. Now you could say, Rendan, you could, you know, do you get poison grease? And my answer to that would be, uh, do you like farming in this game? Because I already farm um, for like a million things on this build and I do not want to add another thing to it. Again, every weapon or almost every weapon this character has is either applying some sort of slow bleed status or slow poison status over time. It's not something this character relies on. Again, as I said before, it is a strength build. It's not an arcane build. But these things apply a lot of slow pressure over time and can be very useful against multiple people. As you can see here with this, with this host, excuse me, I'm hitting him with the Nagakiba, which is building up, you know, bleed, but I'm also hitting him with the Spike Club, which inherently has bleed, but also has poison on it. All of these things combined mean there's a lot of status effects building up. Future post-original editing Rendan here. Since patch 1.009 just came out, uh, I was talking about this Founder and Curve Great Swords actually before this in this part. It's my first quick swap weapon below my root weapon. Uh, they have made Curve Great Swords, well, a lot of things, but Curve Great Swords particularly much, much better. So what I do with this is I use the Dismounter and I have the Ash of War Wild Strikes on it. Basically the R1 can chain into the L2 and then another R1 or R2. You do this by pressing R1 and then lightly tapping L2 one time, and then either pressing R1 or R2 again after that. 
Now, they have made R2s on the Dismounter and Crow Greatswords extremely fast after uh, patch 1.009 to the point uh, where they're almost as fast or maybe even faster than the R1s. That is ridiculous. That is incredibly viable and they're very, very good now. Also, the crouching R1s are even faster than what you see in this clip. So, Dismounter, Curve Great Swords, very, very good. Now I like this build a lot, but it's not going to beat everything. If you come across someone using Power Stance Rot Spears, a Soft Swap Stormhawk Axe, High Poise, and a Great Rune, you're probably not going to beat that. And if you do beat that, it's not going to be the easiest thing in the world to do. My channel, I'm not always trying to show you meta builds. I did, in my last video I was talking about being cute but mean. I'm not aiming for, you know, using the best things in this game. I don't have inherently any problem with anybody in the community who uses stuff like that or who makes content talking about how to use those things. I think it's important to know how to use the strong things in this game. So if you come across people that are, you know, not playing fair or not playing very fun, then you know how to beat them and you can deal with the setups that they have because there's most certainly, definitely a huge amount of players that do that. But if, if I have a message on my channel and what I'm trying to do, again, I like to use setups and find cool and interesting little things that are medium. You know, they're not, they're not incredibly strong, uh, but they can be dangerous. And if you're not expecting them, they can combine in interesting ways to, uh, to really surprise people. That's, that's the fun I have out of this game. That's what I get out of build making. I want to find something that people don't really use. They didn't see that, you know, was something that you could do. And you're like, oh, wow, that's really interesting. That's a neat way to play that build. Maybe I should try something similar, or maybe I should try to build something new on my own. Now, you might be wondering on this build also, because I just thought of it right now, <laughs> or talking about it right now, why I'm using the Dismounter instead of the Bloodhound's Fang on this build, because the Bloodhound's Fang does a little bit of inherent bleed and would work uh, perfectly uh, with this setup. And first of all, I would say you are a very astute observer, uh, so thank you for that. Also, you're paying very close attention, so I guess good for you. Uh, the Bloodhound's Fang, unfortunately, was my first thought for this build, but it is a little bit too heavy to wield with my setup and also keep that club in my offhand, which again is, is, you know, it's not critical, but I just like it for this build. So it didn't really work out the way I wanted it to. I just could not find a use for the Bloodhound's Fang because of that reason. So I went with the Dismounter, but I really, really liked Wild Stripes and the Dismounter. So I'm perfectly fine with the setup. If you want me to talk about Piercing Fang on the Flamberge is the first quick swap option to the right of my weapon. Uh, I will. I mean, I, I think it's fairly obvious. Piercing Fang on a great sword is just really the way to go. It's a great way to break any type of person who's holding some sort of great shield, um, you know, fingerprint shield, anything like that. Uh, great swords have good poise damage. They're good weapons overall now. They were buff like the curved great swords were and a bunch of other things were uh, in patch 1.009. In addition to that, as I said before, the Flamberge has innate bleed. So it plays very well into this build. And I don't see Flamberge a lot, so I like to rep it when I get it. So yeah, that's the that's the quick swap option to my right.
The whole point behind me making this video now is to encourage people to try to step out of their comfort zone like I'm doing. We all got routed down different lanes in the soul genre depending on how we got started and the content that we first consumed at that time. I cut my teeth back in Dark Souls 3. While that was never easy in Invasions, in many ways it was never as hard as Elden Ring is. You will rarely get co-invaders, the minimum of players you will face is two at a time, poison inhibits a lot of the weapon options you can utilize effectively in PvP, and if you do come across a solo host, they are most likely using a Taunter's Tongue and using very strong setups against you. I've had to change a lot of my tactics since the previous game, and it wasn't always something that came you know, easy to me or was comfortable. Going back to Dark Souls 3 is a nice therapy session for me now. But because of my time in Elden Ring, I've actually become a more effective invader in Dark Souls 3, and I will always be grateful to Elden Ring for that. There are plenty of content creators that are still doing a lot of things in Elden Ring. They're putting out a lot of great videos for you to watch. There's very interesting stuff coming from Prin, you know, Blade of Maya, you know, all sorts of content creators that still care a lot about this game. To be fair, Prince last bit was a little bit <laughs> was a little bit critical of it, but I still I still think he really really likes it. And I, you know, I think that there's a lot to look forward to in this game. DLC is obviously on the horizon. DLC is coming. Uh, you know, there'll be patches with that. There'll be things in PvP that are changed, maybe for the good, maybe for the bad. Regardless, the sandbox will change. Dark Souls 3 didn't stay the same. You know, people like Saint Riot got us through the hard times in those games to the better times that came beyond. We're still playing Elden Ring now. We're still playing Dark Souls 3. We go back to all the old games. We will be playing Elden Ring a year from now. Hopefully it's not a year before DLC comes out, but if it is, that's fine. There's, my whole point is, and what I'm trying to say, don't give up on Elden Ring. Keep trying to learn new things. Keep trying to expand your skills and just keep trying to enjoy it when you can. You don't have to play it all the time. If you're in mostly, you know, if you're mostly into duels, you can probably learn some more fun ways to invade, like from uh, Peeve or Pincognito, Pinko, uh, and Saint Riot. Now, if you've been watching those content creators for forever and you're having issues fighting people in ganks, again, Blade of Maya might be someone you could get some 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 good, you know, tips and invasions from. He's a great content creator and deals with stuff like that all the time. I'm just saying, you don't have to route yourself down one lane in the Souls content. You can find a lot of different ways to expand your knowledge, and I encourage you to do so. And that's basically going to be the end of the video. There's actually a whole lot more invasion clips attached to the end of this, just because I didn't know what to do with the footage, and I thought they were all pretty good, uh, enough to warrant being included in this anyway. So feel free to watch those if you want to, although obviously you don't have to, you're a free person. I would again highly encourage uh, everyone and just leave you with this note. There's gonna be a little bit of time before Elden Ring DLC comes out, and you know you'll be playing the Elden Ring DLC. So if there's anything you wanna learn now, any skill sets, any techniques, any type of inventory management, suggest you go ahead and check it out because you will be playing Elden Ring when that comes out. So if you know these things now, take the time to learn them now. You'll be ready for it when the time comes. Uh, the next video will be on DS3, so look forward to that. But I hope you enjoyed, and I look forward to seeing you in the next one. Thanks. Peace.